Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Anne Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast. Because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Ungrading, Anne and I discuss ungrading, why rating students undermines learning, and what to do instead. Edited by Susan Bloom. I'm obsessed with the problem of grades. Mm -hmm. And so I thought we could start out by reading a chapter from Susan Bloom's, it's an edited collection called Ungrading. And I chose Susan Bloom's chapter in the book because she's the editor of it. She's an anthropology professor at Notre Dame. And she shares my frustration with or skepticism about the merits of grading. And so I thought it'd be fun for us to talk about to read this chapter together and talk about it. So like on a on a scale of one to ten, what would you give this chapter? <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about how you understand the term ungrading? I think it's an attempt to interrogate what it is we're doing when we we have an arbitrary measure that we hold students up against. I guess a little anecdote, right? When I was teaching high school, I was really struggling with this idea of grades. I didn't, I was teaching writing. And when students are writing memoir and personal narrative, which was very popular in the early 90s, I came up with this idea of just giving them some form of lovely. <laughs> so I would write lovely. And sometimes I'd write almost lovely, very lovely, very nearly lovely. <laughs> And How did they like, respond to that? Oh my God, they'd argue with me. Like, why is it? Why is this an almost lovely? How come it's not lovely? <laughs> and then even talking about what what is lovely? What does that mean? What does lovely mean? Because I chose the word lovely because I guess it's what, when you read a poem and you don't know, it strikes you just in a visceral way. At least for me, you just say, "Wow, that was lovely." Like the poem we enjoyed at the inauguration, right? We're not critically evaluating it yet. We're just re viscerally responding to it. Oh my God, that was lovely. That's right. Yeah, and so I wanted to like use that word be because I just found it not an evaluative word, but, but a kind of response to how I felt about your effort at communicating this experience that you've had. And it was, it was and this is, I guess now 30 years ago, thinking about with my students what we what I called the commitment to the process. I entered college as an art major, so it's very similar. I, I can't grade students on their ability to create representational art. I can I can evaluate their commitment to their own goals around their ability to make art. And and I think that's what what ungrading is is wrestling with. I want to push back a little bit and say, well, you could, right? I mean, you could say to people, yeah. mm -hmm. here's how Rembrandt drew the human hand. The right. human hand is notoriously difficult to draw. Rembrandt was particularly good at it. How close can you get? I'm going to develop a rubric. But why are we spending our time making these rubrics, right? I mean, and that's, I think, the question mm. that ungrading does, right? I mean, you can do that, but then what's the value of grading someone's drawing that way? So I'm going to stay in that art space for a second. When I, It's interesting that you chose the hand because I was doing this woodcut of, of a hand, which I found extremely difficult. And the preparatory sketches, and I wrestled with them, and it was... It had nothing to do really with the instructor. I had this idea of what that hand should look like. And I was trying mm -hmm. to kind of recreate that idea using the, the available tools. The instructor's role, is, as far as I can remember, is to encourage me and, and help me understand the application of technique. Right. Encouragement, <laughs> you mean encouragement in a really rich sense of the word right it's not just like go steve you can do it it's more it's more than that it's it's so this is where i think bloom's conversation around portfolio is really interesting okay what a portfolio gives a student is a record of her development over time when you get discouraged look where look at earlier attempts you know right. and you could track that development 
One of the things that I've learned from Kathy Davidson's interrogation of grading and the problems with grading, is, and this is something that Bloom talks about too, is having a conversation with students very early on in the semester about what their goals are for the course. Kind of where are you starting and what do you hope to get out of it? And that was a missing piece in my understanding of the portfolio because so much of the portfolio work for me, I resisted it because it felt like it was layering a ton of labor onto the very end of the semester when my I'm most tired. Mm -hmm. But if you have that preliminary conversation about what are your goals for this semester and how, do, how are we gonna work together on our shared course goals and what are my goals for you as a learner, what are your goals for yourself as a learner, if you've kind of scaffolded that into the beginning, then the final assessment, it makes sense to me that she's able to say, mm -hmm. I have a five minute exit conference with them. Yeah, I mean, I think all a portfolio is, is a, is a story. It's a story of a, a learner's development over time. When you talk about the arts, alternative assessments, portfolio, it sort of makes more sense. When you think about more quantitative subjects, then it, it gets difficult. I think the answer here that Bloom doesn't touch upon, but I've wrestled with a lot, especially in our work over the past you know, two semesters, is really to think about the metacognitive components of a portfolio, where a student talks to herself about her own development, that absent that self-reflection and metacognition, students are doing work for me, their teacher. Yeah. And so what I need to do is remove myself, like you're not doing this for me, and I am not doing the class to you. It's, it's a joint effort to try to understand this, this content, these competencies, these concepts more fully. And that's not going to look the same for everyone. What do I do with a student who just took the introductory course because he had four other really hard courses he sort of gamed the system to take the introductory course to get the three math credits, as opposed to another student, say, who's an, a, an adult non-traditional learner who hasn't taken math in 15 years and is really struggling. So if I only measure, well, you know, student A got a 10 on the quiz and you got an eight, absent any commitment of time and resources and struggle, I don't even, what am I evaluating them? Like, what's the point of this? And I, in the very first paragraph, she calls it the game of school. And that is so powerful, that idea. So we have students, and I, I think many of our students at, a, at an institution like Fordham are good at school. Yes, yes. And, and she's coming out of her book, which I haven't read, this research is coming out of her book called I Love Learning, I Hate School. And she's thinking about developing learners rather than people who are good at school. And do you remember that she has that term, that mini max mm -hmm. um, approach to learning, right? If you're good at the game of school, you figure out the least amount of work you can get for the grade that you need to earn in order to pr proceed to the next level of the game. Yeah. All right. So if I only need a B in calculus because it's not my major and I just need to maintain my 3.5, then that's the game I'm playing and I'm only aiming for a B. It's it's hard that, that people, students like at Fordham who are, who've proven their academic fitness and competence are, are not deserving or good learners, but there is a certain awareness of the system that helps you negotiate that system. One of the things I really like in Bloom's chapter, which is quite short, is her list of the problems of grading, right? So she yeah. describes grading as requiring uniformity, as providing inadequate information to the learner, as not being motivating to additional learning. But the one that I like isn't actually, the one that I like most isn't actually in that bulleted list that I just highlighted for you, but it comes a couple paragraphs earlier where she says, Grading is a teacher-centered sorting exercise. Grades become a tag for our, like it's an, like a mnemonic device for us. Someone comes back to us two years later and says, I'm applying to law school. I got an A in your class. 
will you recommend me? Some of my colleagues, I know some of our colleagues are comfortable with this sorting exercise as a way of saying, these are the people that should be admitted to medical school. These yeah. are not, these are the people who should not. It always comes down to the brain surgeon. Would you really want a brain surgeon who got a C and what, you know what I mean? It's always, yeah. I don't disagree, I guess, with the underlying point that we need to make sure that students are competent along certain relevant dimensions. The question is, how do we make sure and how do we communicate that surety to a broader audience? So letters are just simply expedient, right? That's all. It's easy. You know, if you, if you really thought about the urgency or the importance of brain surgery, then a, one piece of paper with a list of letters on it doesn't seem adequate to the task, really. There are all different kinds of physicians. There are all different kinds of attorneys. There are all different kinds of teachers. A narrative assessment is really what's more valuable. Well, I mean, we have a tendency to, I mean, this is a tautology, right? But we measure things that are measurable. Right. We avoid measuring things that are harder to measure. Be because we're evaluating things that are easier to evaluate, we're privileging those qualities, which I'm, I'm not saying they're not unimportant qualities. Self-regulation skills, stick to itiveness, you know, motivation, cognitive and non-cognitive non skills certainly combine to make someone an effective student. But there may be a whole suite of other skills that we're not measuring because they're so difficult to get our hands around. One of the things I really love about this book is that most of the teachers who've written chapters here, and I haven't read the whole book, but I've read a good bit of it. It's a mix of K through 12 instructors and mm -hmm. higher ed teachers. And many, if not most of them have to assign a grade at some point in, you know, so they, they ultimately do have to give the B plus. Alfie Cohn in the preface, you know, he's a great old radical teacher. Mm -hmm. and he's like, you should protest, you know, why don't you go to your Dean and say, we're getting rid of grades altogether. But most of these people are operating within a system that's mm -hmm. unlikely to change imminently, right? And there will be a grade ultimately. Yeah, I remember I, way, way back, it's gotta be 10 years ago, Mike Roberts, <laughs> I gave this talk where at the beginning of the semester, I said, you know, class participation is really important. This is an evening class, we're here for three hours. I really need you guys to you know, participate in the discussion. And you know, when I'm sitting down to give your final grade, if I don't know your name, that could be an indication you really haven't participated. And Mike Roberts punctured that whole thing by the entire semester spoke in the third person. Mike <laughs> Roberts thinks that, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, Mike Roberts is right. That's a ridiculous rule. If you don't talk to me publicly, you're not engaged in the class. You don't care what, and we do this all the time to our students. We, we guess why right. they're not talking, why they don't look engaged, what their facial expressions mean. And we have no way of knowing, we're just guessing. Paper is riddled with errors in standard written English, right? Mm -hmm. Until you know the student, you don't know, are those uh, in, in cautious errors? Are those a lack of knowing the, standards of a college paper is that because they don't care about your class you know so people often take it personally you know you didn't take my class seriously enough well right is that the those, problem that those, may not those guesses are hugely important that we make and i think part of what what susan blum is getting at is that we shouldn't be guessing we should know we should have open conversations around a meta conversation about the class. Like, what are we doing together? What does it mean? What is your experience of it? Are we co-creating something? As a poor math student, I experienced math class as a math club. It was just this conversation and this group that I wasn't really part of. I was watching these people do and really seem to enjoy math. And I just couldn't access that, that cognitive activity, that level of enjoyment that sense of being part of something. It happens very quickly in my experience as a learner, who is part of that group and who isn't. I, I wanna be clear, I'm not 
disparaging disciplines of mathematics or sociology or philosophy. It's just thinking about what, first of all, what do grades do, not just to students, right? The effects on their prospects, their self-efficacy beliefs, but what does it do to us as teachers? Do grades have a distorting effect on our project of getting people excited about the thing we we're teaching them. That's so important. I had a mentor um, when I was starting teaching and I was teaching first year writing and he was a poet, really, really creative guy. Did, did he know it? But he, his speech showed it. He told me that if I had more than, I was teaching small classes, so 15 students in freshman writing, um, if I had more than three students with the same letter grade, my grading system was insufficiently refined. And so his rule of thumb was you could have three and only three A's, regardless of, you know, the yeah. random sort of people, and three and only three A minuses, three and only three B pluses, right? So you ha it had to sort out that way. And if you ended up with more than three in any single category, you needed to dig back in. And I, I took that as gospel. And then I would get to the papers and I would think, well, this doesn't make sense. I don't, I can't refine it better. And I thought, well, I must not be smart enough. I must not really understand how to do this thing called grading. If all my students do really well, is that an indictment of a lack of academic rigor or an indication that we built an effective community of inquiry over the course of these five months. What does that signal to whoever's going to look at the grades for the class that I taught? Do they come away with, wow, there's like a lot of A's and A minuses in this class. You know, D'Agostino did a really good job this semester, or this clearly is not rigorous enough. I want to ask you what you think about the solutions that Bloom proposes. So she says, decenter the grade. So she defers giving anyone a letter for a really long time. My experience of that at Fordham has not been positive, right? I mean, I've found working with um, traditional age undergraduates who are grade motivated, saying, oh, don't worry about the grade, it comes later. Yeah, you can't, I, you can't really do that to them. They have a low tolerance for ambiguity. And you're asking them to trust you when they don't know you. If you only give narrative assessments and no grade, in my experience, they try and decode the valence of your lovely to right. map it onto a grade. Exactly. Oh, yeah. almost lovely. So is that like a B plus, almost lovely, or is it a B? The thing, one of the things that really disappointed me in Bloom's chapter was the kind of lack of engagement with or a discussion about how grading relates to questions of diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. how it might relate to, you know, because one of the problems with grades and one of the reasons why I've been interrogating my own grading practices so um, intensively the past few years is trying to ensure that I'm not reinstantiating racial or gender-based biases or any kind of biases, class-based biases in the way I assess students. Yeah, I don't want to do that. I want to take people seriously as learners for themselves and minimize my biases in so far as it's possible. And one of the things that interests me most about these moves to interrogate grading is how they can be mobilized for equity. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there's there's a lot there, but what immediately struck me is this idea that we in K-12 again, we call teaching from no prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. And and part of what that means is making sure that every one of the students understands what the task is. Because if you say write a paper of three pages, what what's a paper? What is that? You don't know what a paper is? You don't belong, right? So something just as simple as our assumptions. And the other thing really is, well, one of the other things, is generalized agreement among the community about what's a good job. Yes. 
what does that look like? So anchor papers, right? Exemplars, those are really important. And I think also it's not holding the students accountable for competencies I haven't explicitly taught them. A good example is concluding the semester with a presentation. Suddenly I'm in a presentation. It's like the final project, you need to make a cake. Right. Have you built the competencies in these students throughout the semester that culminates in this thing we're calling a presentation? Then, then if you have, then that's, you know, that's great. Right. That's right. What kind of opportunities are we giving to students to demonstrate their learning? That, because that's all an assessment is. It's a way for students to demonstrate that they've learned. And so we've chosen a really narrow number of tools to be able to do that. And I think part of what Susan Bloom is getting at, what she's getting at is, can, can we broaden the available tools, the modes of expression that students are allowed to use to demonstrate what they've learned? What am I, the teacher, doing when I'm evaluating your piece of writing? Well, I want you guys to evaluate this piece of writing so you'll understand what that process is. The idea really is not, there's not going to be someone evaluating your piece of writing forever. The goal is for you to get to the point where you don't need me to evaluate that writing anymore. You can do it on your own. And so are we building that capacity over the course of the semester where students are critically engaged with their own work? One of the things that Bloom talks about is having students give themselves a grade, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've had a semester where students have been critically engaged with their own work, evaluating each other, thinking about how they want to demonstrate having mastered a concept, whether that's, you know, in a creative project or through a more traditional paper or through a presentation of some kind. Have you ever experimented with having students grade themselves and how has that gone? And I'm not sure if grading themselves is the right way that I would frame that, but I have had them evaluate their own work. Mm -hmm. So I can give an example. So we use this tool, VoiceThread. Students make audio comments in response to a series of prompts. So they produce, I don't know, between five and seven minutes of audio content, give or take, each week. What I ask them to do then is to, some at some point, probably about five or six weeks in, I ask them to share a comment that they felt was particularly effective. They talk about why they felt it was effective, not their own comment, someone else's. Mm -hmm. In that discussion, we come up with the three qualities of an effective comment. I ask them to then take to listen to all their previous comments, and in the light of those three qualities, evaluate their commenting thus far in, in four ways. Backward looking. What, what, are you, what are you hearing or noticing about your comments when you re-listen to them? Forward looking. In the future, how might you make your comments different? How might they change? Inward looking. What are you doing to produce these comments? What is your process to make a comment? Do you research? Do you speak extemporaneously? Are you emotionally involved? Like what's happening there? Outward looking. What do your classmates do to make their comments? Do they write a script? Is it bullet points? How might your classmates process affect your own? So what I'm trying to do is move the object of critique from the content to the student's performance. It, again, I'm, I'm doing Bloom's misdirection because like, how, do, how, do you, how would you grade that? Like, what are we grading here? But it's a way of like getting them to think about what is it, what are you producing? What are you making? To, to get them to see their participation in the class, their effort as a kind of content that they should engage with in, in much the same way they didn't, would engage with my lectures or the course content. So it's democratizing. All voices are worthy of reflection, critique, and analysis. One of the things we talk about in my classes that's parallel to this is um, citing each other. So right. when you take notes on class discussion or when you hear something in a voice thread or see something on a discussion board that strikes you as insightful, also make a note of who said it 
and then say, you know, Steve wrote that in a discussion board post on such and such a day. And, you know, figure out the MLA style for discussion board posts. And that actually elevates peer-to-peer -peer learning into, you know, so then they say, does that count as one of the three sources you asked me to think? Yes, absolutely. If yeah. I ask you, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is to get you in in a certain in some of my assignments to have multiple voices in conversation on a similar topic. One of those voices might be a student in your class, someone that from whom you learned. And isn't that great? And isn't that awesome that you're learning from each other? The thing that interests me about this portfolios and metacognition, I'm gonna be really, really frank, is that I have a very limited tolerance for um, that kind of writing, right? I do a lot of it myself in my own, but like reading that stuff, like, you know, there's only so much of that from my students that I want to read and I want to assign because really I want them to be like in the meat of reading and writing about the, the topic that we're studying. So, I mean, I think that there are ways to think about just the way that we, the same way that we vary the content, right? We have content that appeals to visual learners, to auditory learners, to people who, who enjoy or who access text more, most effectively. We can really think about the kinds of communication channels that we're making available to students to express their understanding. Now again, this is this is dicey in a writing class. Yeah. But it's okay to have like an audio journal. And is the is the journal who's it for? What's its role in your learning, right? I mean, I think this gets at something that you and I have talked about a lot that I think, you know, Bloom doesn't really emphasize that much in her chapter, but really thinking about what your goals are for the course. And for me, and I've talked about this many times before, there's kind of three tiers or three flavors of course goals, right? There are the course goals I have in the abstract before the class meets that are, you know, there's the course goals, there's the community goals that we may come to, to together as a cohort going through this course this in a particular semester. And then there are students' individual goals, which are going to vary person to person. And then connected to that, but separate, are the university requirements, mm -hmm. right? Like, what does the department or the university or the school need me to accomplish this semester? And in some classes, that's more explicit than in others, right? But mm -hmm. most of our courses have we want students to do a research paper or have written X number of pages, or they need to be able to get to the 2000 level of this discipline. I guess I would say not cognitive so much as intellectual. And the closest Can you say more about the difference between those two. Yes. Yeah, so I think of cognitive skills like are the, the ability to perform certain competence based tasks. Whereas intellectual to me in this context, I guess, means curious. That after the class is over, they will continue learning about what we learned about. They don't see the class as an ending, right? That they're going to keep thinking about these things and, and learn about them maybe more. And that's part of the ungrading. That's a common goal among the authors of chapters in this book. And there's a lot of anecdotes in multiple chapters of the experience of giving students a paper, returning a paper back that you've spent a lot of time commenting on, having the student look at it, see the A minus, be satisfied with the A minus, and throw it in the garbage can, put it in their notebook, file it away. And it's like the letter grade is an indication to stop learning, right? I'm done. How do we undo that in our students and ignite the kind of curiosity that made us want to be teachers, that makes us want to read, that makes us listen to podcasts and seek out, you know, conversation partners who, you know, ignite our curiosity and foster it, right? And so how do we keep that going in our students? If my first category has to do with like intellectual. Yes. Maybe it's three categories, the personal, both how I feel 
and how the students feel, how they experience the class interpersonally. Mm -hmm. The second is intellectually, their curiosity, interest in what we talked about beyond the life of the course. I think the last thing, uh, I'm making this up as we're talking, but I guess the closest I could come with it to it would be like the moral or the ethical. And, and this is meaningful to me because we, you know, we work at a Jesuit institution, right? right. So that has to do with like, how, how, what does this mean? Like, how is it significant? How, how does this affect the world and my place in it? And the, and the skills and competencies that, that you're acquiring as a learner, what do I do with them? But I'm, I'm wrestling with the idea that I think the purpose of every class is to somehow, to quote the former first lady, be best. <laughs> that I'm here to help you on this journey or project optimistically, which is why we so love being around the students, right? This right. such an optimism that I'm gonna at the end of this semester, I'm gonna be better. Along some dimension, I will have learned or grown in some way. And my role as a teacher is to demonstrate that I'm committed to that project with you. Boiling all of that stuff down that we've been talking about for this hour into a B plus it doesn't cover it. It just doesn't seem enough, enough information. And if I, when I do that, it seems like that, as you say, it drowns out everything else. The comments on the paper, my struggle to present myself as caring and committed to them. Well, how much did I really care if I just screwed you with a B minus? Right. You know? Right, right. A B minus, I mean, and that's one of the things that, that that's the reality of our lives, right? Is that a B minus could screw somebody because it's just that hair's breadth away from someone losing their scholarship. Yeah, so it's really fraught. And I, I know the tension here is academic rigor and great inflation, right? What do, what do we do? How do we, you know, when confronted with those ideas, like how do we respond to that? Like, I can't walk in there and say, everybody gets an A, it's a big party, let's just read this book and talk about it. Where students are starting, their prior experiences of, of the discipline and of school and of how classes work and function culturally, what's expected of them. If we can address those things, their commitment to the process, what, what do I do with a student who tried really hard who really showed development, but didn't reach an appropriate level of mastery, right? right? Who was engaged and thoughtful and worked really hard and deeply committed and it, and just couldn't, you know, I just don't get, I, I'm just not, they're not getting there. And you, every time they raise their hand, internally your fingers are crossed and they just right. don't quite see it. Right, I mean, one of the, one of the ideas I really, like and has been really helpful to me is this idea of the threshold concept, right? That there are some difficult to grasp, you know, disciplinary ideas and students attain those concepts unevenly, right? And it may not happen for you at the appropriate moment in the semester, right? We can't always time your attainment of a threshold concept to fall in time for you to get your B and move on, right? Sometimes you don't get there in the semester. Sometimes you get there so late in the semester that you still end up with, you know, you haven't attained yeah. the... Yeah. So that what I can do on my own and what I can do with help. So at the end of the semester, I should be letting go of the back of the bicycle. If I don't, then something went wrong. What grades do is that they assign responsibility to the student. That's why it went wrong. To the point about learning from no prior knowledge, one of the challenges if you're an equity-minded instructor is you are aware of the uneven places from in, at which students arrive in your class and the uneven resources they have throughout the 15 weeks that you're their instructor. Yeah. And so the student who's, who starts off 
with less facility in the discipline and is working two jobs and has a long commute or has is caretaking responsibilities at home, but tries and is really committed, what is their path right. to doing well? What grades tell the students is that that doesn't matter. And I think Blum gets at this again. She talks about objectivity. She wrestles with this idea mm -hmm. that grades are like objective. In fact, grades are arbitrary. He's a hard grader. Like, what, is, what does that mean? If it's objective, then there is no such thing as a hard grader. That's right. I've wrestled with this idea of making the course not about me. But inevitably, it's about me. So the question then is, okay, how much is it going to be about me? How do I make it less about me? How do I convey to my students that the readings I've selected for this semester are specific to me without making that sound capricious or arbitrary or random? And we have conversations all the time in my classes about the reason readings are on the syllabus. Unless and until I've given them kind of how I applied my expertise to making the initial choices, our conversations are very different. You know, once we have, once I share with them what my criteria were, then we have a much richer conversation about whether it belonged or not in the set of texts we read together. We didn't talk about the appendix, but I hate the appendix, so. She has this really interesting, she calls it the coda of her chapter, right? Mm -hmm. And I highlighted a sentence that I, I liked, so. She says, the onus is really on me to explain, to meet them where they are, not to fantasize about students who have dreamt of a liberatory pedagogical experience. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's true. We have to understand the students who, who have performed really well under the current grading regime and not to communicate to them that that wasn't that doesn't mean anything that that's not valuable I, I don't think that that's what this ungrading movement if that's the right word is trying to do that's one of the things i think that's really powerful about that right is it's not a fantasy of students who've dreamt of a liberatory pedagogical experience especially i think if we're equity-minded one of the cruelest things we could do to a first generation student, a student who comes from an economically disadvantaged background, a student who doesn't have a lot of family college in their back in their uh, history is to say, okay, now that you're here, we're totally changing the game again. Right, exactly, exactly right. We don't, we don't want to, um, I think something we haven't hit on really is the joy that students get from an A or even a B plus. I've seen it in my own children and in students that have reached out to me after the class, how proud of themselves they are. I mean, we tend to focus in these ungrading com conversations sometimes on the more fraught conversations around, around grading, right? About gr you know arguments or, or grades that maybe we struggled with and students struggled with. But I, I mean, I can think of grades that I've gotten that I've been so proud that I got that grade. I worked so hard for it. And I, I, I think it's important not to communicate that grades are meaningless, but just to suggest that there may be ways that are more meaningful. That's great. I love that. Yes. Twice Over Podcast is available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify with new episodes appearing twice each week. For host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, twiceoverpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at twiceover1 or email us at twiceoverpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.